Uh, so we always start off these with the same question, which is what were you like growing up and what was your life like growing up? Okay. Um, well, I grew up uh, here in Madison, Connecticut, um, just up the road. It's actually where Clarity is based today. Um, I was the youngest of four kids. Uh, I had two older brothers and a sister. Um, very active in sports growing up. Um, from the time I was little, I was always uh, interested in, in trying to make money for whatever reason. Um, and uh, I remember a couple of funny stories. I, I, being the youngest of four, I tended to get away with a lot of stuff. I think my parents were quite tired by the time they got to me. So um, I got away with a lot. I was kind of on autopilot. And a um, uh, story about, about making money. I, um, I remember I was a little kid and I gathered up pine cones from my neighbor's yard and I took them home and I, I cleaned them all up and, and I put them in a, in a bag and I brought them up to her doorstep and I, I actually sold them to, <laughs> to, to the lady who owned the trees that I took the pine cones from. And I was really excited, I was really proud. I went home, I told my mother, you know, that I, I made whatever, 50 cents. and. Um, my mom was not quite proud of me at that time, and I had to return the money. Uh, but she let me keep the pine cones, so I still had the, had the, had the goods. But uh, um, I was always a hard worker. I had a lot of, lot of different jobs from the time I was really little, you know, uh, not just selling pine cones, but um, I had paper routes and dishwasher. And uh, when I, I was really active in sports. I played lacrosse all the way through college, but in high school, my friend and I, uh, started a business where we were custom stringing lacrosse sticks and dyeing lacrosse sticks for, for kids on the team. Um, so that was my childhood. So you had a decent number of entrepreneurial experiences. Obviously not all of them were supported by your parents. Um, <laughs> but do you attribute that to having parents that were entrepreneurs? Did they support you in some way or were you kind of just going at it on your own? I would say it's a mixture of both. Um, my mom was a full-time mom and also a, a preschool teacher, and, uh, but my father was uh, an entrepreneur. When I was little, he had different uh, various sales jobs. He was working in the city when I was little, uh, but by the time I got to middle school, he started his own company. So to this day, he's been my biggest mentor and uh, confidant in terms of starting my own company. Did he push you to go out and work when you were young? Uh, I wouldn't say he pushed me, but it was kind of a, it was kind of a known fact in our household. Um, you know, things that we needed, we were provided for. Things that we wanted, we could go get ourselves. So, you know, I didn't need to worry about food or clothing, but if I wanted a stereo, I would, I better make money to buy it myself. So then you went to college, you studied marketing. What took you to marketing, and did you? Did that kind of benefit you when you later went on to sales and run a business, or you kind of relearned when you got into the real world? Absolutely. So funny story. Um, I went to Bentley University, which is a, primarily a, a business school um, outside of Boston. And um, uh, most of the folks at that time coming out of Bentley were either accounting or finance majors. And um, I just knew I wanted to be in business. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do when I went to college. Um, but I always gravitated towards the marketing classes. I enjoyed them. Um, but to that extent, I also had experience in the finance and accounting classes, and I really struggled in them. I hated it, and uh, I knew very early on that I wasn't going to succeed in that world. So, you know, nine out of ten people who come out of Bentley end up being accountants, or, or at least at that time, accountants or, or bankers, and uh, I wasn't going to be one of them. Um, but I really loved the marketing classes, particularly, like, uh, there's uh, marketing for services classes I took and advertising classes, and those really appealed to me and, and seemed to fit my personality well. Um, I remember one class in particular, I... Uh, uh, it was a marketing and services class, and one of our projects was to to do a program for a local nonprofit who um, didn't have an advertising budget, and you had to create a whole advertising campaign to draw more people. And uh, I chose in Waltham, Massachusetts, where Bentley is. There's a, a watch museum, and I ended up working with the folks at the watch museum and 
creating this whole program of how they could promote things on the radio and on TV and in print ads. And um, I did a great job. I got a, a good grade on the paper. Um, and afterward, you know, the, the folks from the Watch Museum were so excited. They're like, this, this is great. Like, when are you going to do all this? And I'm like, I'm still a student. I can't really do this, but you have the paper so you could try and do it yourself. <laughs> Uh, but that's when I knew, like, that was my knack. That's what I wanted to do. And, and um, I didn't know I was going to start a company, but I knew I wanted to be in business and something sales marketing oriented. So was then your first job out of college? My first job out of college. So I graduated from college, and I immediately drove across country to Denver, Colorado. And I drove out there without a job. Um, I had a U-Haul filled with stuff, and... I had a roommate who was backpacking in Europe, so he was going to show up another month or two later. And um, I needed to get a job right away. And I ended up getting a job working for this guy who was selling credit card processing machines and leases on payment processing uh, for small businesses. And it was, it was not the highlight of my career. It was, it was really a borderline uh, unethical business I was in. It really felt like we were taking advantage of small business owners. And uh, I didn't last long in that job. I was there for about six weeks. And the whole time I was there, I was looking for a different job. I would say my first real job that I had um, was working for a company called McBee Systems. And um, this was back in the early 90s, before everyone was doing online banking and QuickBooks and all that. Everyone was managing their uh, small business checking accounts through um, uh, manual check writing systems. And McBee specialized in, in a small business checking system. And I would work with the local banks to get referrals and cold call on small businesses. And I stayed there for about a year. So you then went to Print for Systems. Uh, and how'd you end up there, and how'd you kind of end up? I think your previous role was sales as well, but how'd you end up in a sales role? Yeah, so Printing for Systems is actually my father's company, which was started here in, in Connecticut. And uh, before I even moved to Denver, after I graduated from college, I, I went to my father and said, I'd love to work for the company, you know, figuring he would just let me work for the company. He said, no dice. You can go get a job, make sure... Make sure that, uh, A, you want to be in sales and, and make sure you get some exposure to this, uh, to the business world before um, you can start working here. So I, I was at McBee for a year, and after that year was up, I had a really successful career there. I was in the President's Club and, and all of that stuff, um, and I felt like I was good at sales and, and enjoying it. Um, so... I was living in Denver. All of PSI's clients were concentrated on the East Coast and, and the Mid-Atlantic states, and we really didn't have a presence on the West Coast. So I um, convinced him to let me take a sales job and try and develop clients on the West Coast and Midwest. How'd you convince him? Well, it, it wasn't too hard because it wasn't really a, a cushy job. It was a, um, uh, the position was 100% commission. So there was no salary at all. Um, so I was living off uh, what was called a draw. So I would borrow money from the company to pay my bills every month. Um, and then once commissions started rolling in, then I wouldn't need the draw anymore or I could, I could pay off the loan. Um, so uh, it wasn't hard to convince him because it was basically like, okay, you think you can get clients on the West Coast? Go for it. What made you think that uh, sort of going back, why did you want to be in sales? But then, then what made you think, hey, I've been in this for a year. Obviously, you've done pretty well, but I'm willing to kind of take on the responsibility to build this business really from scratch on the West Coast. Yeah, so I was always attracted to sales. The main reason was I didn't want to have a ceiling on my potential to make money. Um, and frankly, all of my friends out of college got much better jobs than I did. Their salaries were much higher, um, but they were capped. And I was willing to take a much lower salary for the opportunity to be able to make more. Um, so that's, in general, that's what appealed to me from a sales, job, from a sales career. And um, uh, what I had at PSI was exactly that. Um, I was in control of my own destiny. I could work as little or as much as I wanted to. Um, and I knew if I worked a little, it was going to um, uh, uh, directly impact my paycheck. 
And so um, I like the idea of being able to work hard and reap the rewards for that hard work. And, and that's really how I ended up in sales. Is it something you had to learn or now when you have salespeople working for you, you have to teach or is it natural or you don't know how to do it if you don't know how to do it? Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. You know, with any career, learning is a part of it. But I think there are certain personality traits you look for in salespeople um, that are a necessity to, to be successful in that role. And, and we certainly look for that at, at Clarity as well. What kind of traits are those? Well, um, I can't speak for, for every company, but for Clarity, I think our sales process is, uh, sales cycle is quite long. We, um, uh, a quick deal for us might close in you know, 12 to 16 weeks, which would be really fast, but typically they could go six months to a year. Uh, and during that six months to a year cycle, we're really developing relationships with our prospects, and we are um, really, uh, I call it a consultative sales process where we're educating our prospects before they ever buy from us. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have to be good at developing relationships. You become friends with these people long before they send you money, and some of them never end up, you know, signing on with you. Mm -hmm. So you have to be, you know, you have to be persistent. You have to take rejection well, because um, you're going to get rejected a lot. Um, but you, know, you, you, you can't give up. So going back a little bit, uh, what made you decide you wanted to break away and start your own business? So... Uh, Printing for Systems was acquired by a company called Metavante um, while I was there, and this is going back like 2003. And um, part of the acquisition, there was an earnout period for three years, which I stuck around for. I was I was one of a few of the salespeople that really um, were driving the growth of the company at the time. So I stayed for three years, but during that tenure, uh, a lot of the things that we were really good at. Um, as a company, were starting to diminish, and what I mean by that is, is Printing for System was known for was known for great technology, really good customer service, and we were a very profitable company. Um, after we were acquired, those three things seemed to diminish a little bit. And um, a typical big company buys small company. This is what happens in life and in in, in mergers and acquisitions. Um, but it was really frustrating for me because I was on the front lines. I was dealing with the clients, and it got to a point where, you know, I couldn't defend what we were doing, and more importantly, I couldn't impact what we were doing. So they would come to me and say, what's going on? How can we change this? How can we fix this? And my hands were tied. And that became so frustrating to the point that I started having water cool cooler talk with um, another gentleman I, I worked with who's now my chief technology officer about, hey, do you think we could do this on our own and do you think we could do it better? And that's really when I started to think about you know, going out on my own. It was probably um, you know, one year before I left. Mm -hmm. So then was the, was the business the, at that point very similar to what you were doing with Printing for Systems and then the acquirer or did you kind of have, have a new vision that you had to build out and has that changed over time from what you anticipated the business Yeah, being? so it's a good question. We, we had a different vision. Um, printing for Systems, as the name implies, really focused on print. We put a lot of processes and systems in front of a print process. Um, so most of our company, uh, most of our customers thought that we were a printer, thought we owned printing equipment, but, but we did not. Uh, really, what we were was a software company that managed the print process. So when I started Clarity, we decided to uh, be a little more bold and just advertise that all we are is a software company. And we want to manage your communications. We want to help you create them. Um, but we're agnostic to the print process. We will manage it for you. We'll do a very good job managing it because we know how to. Um, but we're agnostic, and if you don't want to print things, we will send them electronically, we'll send them digitally, et cetera. And that was really uh, the main difference between my old job and what Clarity is. Mm -hmm. So do you think when you're launching a business, if you're giving advice to the crowd, um, particularly for a B2B business, you have to be in a position like the one you're in where you are either experiencing the pain or you're in a sales position where you see the pain every day? Or can you kind of start as from an outsider and make it happen? 
Well, I can only speak to my own experience. Um, I, I'm sure both uh, possibilities are, are um, valid. Um, for me, yeah, it, it helped to feel the pain. It helped to see the market and, and see the, what my clients' needs were and see that they weren't being met. Um, that gave me an, an advantage to be able to see, like, if I could put these things together on the back end, I'm pretty sure people will buy them. Um, and, and that's what we did. But it, it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be, I'll tell you that. Uh, what surprised you? What was more difficult? Was it just getting people to kind of trust a new business? Yeah, so I knew that we had a good idea. I knew we had great technology. And I knew, you know, my customers liked me. And so in my mind, I was like, this is a no-brainer. I'm going to give them a better product. They already trust me. And I know I can be price competitive. So I started the company. and was like, this is going to be easy. It's going to take off in no time. Um, but I was wrong. And it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't quick at all. And I remember I have a, one of my best friends. He, he, you know, I told him what I was doing. And after he thought I was a little bit crazy, he's like, listen, it's probably going to take you twice as long as you think. And it's going to cost you twice as much money. And I was like, whatever. No, it's not. I know what I'm doing. This is going to be great. And um, he was absolutely right. And, and I've had other people tell me that along the way. And it's ab he, was, he was dead right. It took me twice as long as I expected. And it cost twice as much money as I expected. So what did your team look like when you started? Was it just you? Um, no. So actually, I started. I had two developers. And then I had... Uh, administrative person who were on my payroll and myself who was not on the payroll. So we were a, a team of four in the beginning. And when I left Medavante, I had a, a non-compete in my contract. So I had one year where I couldn't call on all of my customers and, and the industry um, that I knew so well. So we spent a year um, developing the software, uh, developing our marketing plan, and also um, calling on other industries. Um, fairly unsuccessfully, but um, trying. Um, how do, did you eventually find something that worked by going back to the original industry? And how, you know, how did you decide what industry to really focus on? Yeah, I knew I wanted to be in, in, in healthcare. You know, all our, my specialty and my contacts were all um, in health insurance. And uh, when I started the company, um, what, what PSI was known for was manufacturing uh, membership ID cards. So the, the ID card that you guys likely have in your wallet, uh, there's a good chance that it would have come from someone like us. And when I started Clarity, uh, most people who thought I was crazy were like, don't get into this market. Making the ID cards is not that profitable anymore. There's only you know two real players in this industry. They're multi-billion dollar companies with deep pockets. And so I was, I was convinced that they were right. And I'm like, I need to stay away from ID cards, but I'm going to focus on other member materials that the health plans make, which were more profitable. And our software was, was really um, geared towards managing. Um, but what I found was, you know, we marketed that very hard. Um, but what the clients kept coming back with was like, yeah, 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 that's great. We want to do that. But you have to, you got to fix my ID cards. That was the most important thing to them. So we had a land and expand strategy after the fact in which we decided we will, we will take on the ID cards. And once we can do that, then we can get into these other communications, which, you know, would lead to greater profitability for us. So you're going into the ID card business. Everybody's told you don't go into the ID card business. Yeah, How I don't do you kind of push to through that. No, it, it was really driven by uh, the market need, you know, and, and it was kind of a wake-up call. Um, and frankly, doing ID cards for, for, for me was easy. I had all the relationships. I knew what I was doing. Um, I just didn't know if I could, su could succeed because I knew the margins. There were two big competitors when I left Medavante. There was Medavante and one other large competitor. And the way they were winning business was just seeing who could do it for a cheaper price. And that's a no-win situation for a startup. So uh, we tried to stay away from it, but when the clients were saying, look, we have a problem here, uh, I had to go into those prospects and say, look, we want to do this, but 
I can't play at the numbers these guys are playing with. They'll buy your business. They'll pay you for your business. Where unfortunately we have to, you know, we have to put food on our table. We have to make money doing this. Um, so it took longer. It took longer to get things going, but but we were able to succeed by being creative in our sales process. And and really, what we had to do, or what we did to succeed, was offer these clients uh, a free pilot program to to try us out. So we actually would sign agreements that said we will build out the software. Every every program we have, we have over 100 clients on our platform today. Every one is customized to the client. So we would build it for free, and at any point in time, if they were unhappy with our service, they could leave with no penalties, no strings attached. So it gave them like a get out of jail free card and the ability to test drive before they before they uh, signed on with us. So um, you're in this position where you have to do a lot of work and you're not getting paid yet. Um, how at that point are you thinking about funding the business? Yeah, so that, that was, uh, there were a lot of sleepless nights. Um, I funded the business myself. I ended up using all the money that I had saved up um, to fund the business. We had very humble beginnings. You know, we weren't in a nice uh, office building here in New Haven, and uh, we were in very cheap office space. I was, uh, I had a, a room that was much, much smaller than this with a couple of plastic fold-up tables and some computers on them and, and a phone. And um, we had humble beginnings. So I ended up using my savings, had a second mortgage on my house. And then uh, I mentioned it took twice as long as we thought. I ended up borrowing some money from my father. Uh, but we always avoided taking money from the outside. Um, we also started the company in 2007. And for those of you who have been around, might remember the financial crisis, 2009. Um, we were in the middle of that, so we couldn't get money if we wanted to. I remember talking to banks, uh, these banks were calling on us for small business loans, and I would meet with these guys because we, we needed money, and uh, we were excited about the possibility, and, and at the end of the day, I was like, well, you're pretty much only going to lend me money if you know I already have it, so that doesn't really help me because I wouldn't be here in the first place if I had it, so we had to, we had to go it alone. Was the venture market available then? Did you think about looking at venture money, or was it not something you wanted to do? So, A, I never even thought of it, um, because I didn't want to give up any control of the company. Um, you know, you asked if I don't listen to people. Um, I, I, it was important to me to have control, and uh, when you bring on venture money, you tend to lose that control, or at least lose a portion of that control. Um, but frankly, I never considered it. Um, I had considered a couple of folks that I knew who I thought could be interesting for the company, um, but those opportunities didn't work out, and so I never really looked for outside funding. Did you ever go get outside funding, and if so, when and why? We did. We, we ended up bringing on an investor um, about six or seven years after we started the company. And it wasn't because we needed money. Really what happened, you mentioned some of the, the accolades, right? We were, we've been in the Inc. 500, 5,000, like seven times. Um, we were on the Deloitte Fast 500, uh, the Markham, Connecticut, top 40, um, four or five years in a row at this time. And uh, so when you hit those lists, you become a very popular person. And so um, I was getting inundated by phone calls and emails from private equity firms saying, let us help you, let us help you. And I, I didn't even know what private equity was at the time. And so I finally asked one of my banker colleagues, like, should I be entertaining these private equity firms who keep calling? And, and we ended up talking to a few and um, determined that it would be worthwhile to bring in outside capital for a couple of reasons. One, um, it allowed me to de-risk. I was the sole, you know, for all intents and purposes, the sole stockholder of the company, um, but also we wanted to fuel continued growth. So it's nice to have someone else write a check to help you, you know, invest in other things that, that can help uh, bring the company to the next level. So we ended up doing that in uh, 2013, 14. So how has the business changed since you, you know, you were a four-person per company to 
don't know how many people you have now, but a lot more than four people. How how's kind of running the business changed, and how have you had to change, or have you had to change? Yeah, I'd love to say we haven't changed at all, but um, it's it's a lot different going from from four people to we have I think 140 employees now. Um, you know, the one thing that that is very consistent is we have a people first attitude, and and that that's twofold for me. It's one is you know, hire very carefully. You know, early on, I think a big part of our success is I surrounded myself with really good people, bright people, people who are willing to work hard, and, and people who really bought into and believed in what we were doing. Um, that philosophy remains today. We have a very um, consistent hiring process that we go through. Um, we look for, for bright people, we look for hard workers, but most importantly, we work for, we look for people who are good at working in a team environment. And that's been a big part of our success. Um, but is it the same? No, you know, when we, were, when we were a group of four people, it was really easy to make decisions and to, to change direction. Um, now, you know, we have processes and procedures in place that we need to follow in order to, to scale to the level we're at and to scale to where we're going. So you mentioned, um, actually, not gonna ask that question yet. Uh, Going back to hiring people, uh, how do you kind of know those people are good people? At the beginning, did you get lucky? Had you worked with them before? And now, do you have any kind of suggestions for hiring that to see if people actually can work well in teams or they're actually hard workers or they're actually smart? Because they will probably all tell you those things if you just ask them. They sure they will, or their resumes will tell you that. Um, early on, uh, you know, I said I surrounded myself with good people. I had worked with all these folks. Um, in fact, two of the, uh, you know, two of my partners who I brought on after I started the com company, one of them was a technology guy who was with me at my previous company, so I knew him quite well. And then the other partner was a customer of mine. Um, so I knew their makeup, I knew their work ethic, and, and I knew um, that they really bought into the vision of the company. Um, you know, I have, you know, the same friend who told me, uh, you know, it would take me twice as long, cost me twice as much, also gave me advice and said, listen, whatever you do, hire slow and fire quick. And we still have that philosophy today. And we're very diligent in our hiring process. Um, you know, as you mentioned, yeah, people will tell you they're great. People will have great resumes. People might be great interviewers. Um, but we have a, a series of, of interviews that we go through. We have a, a process that we follow, and we think we've gotten pretty good at it. And you know, you mentioned it earlier, but one of the things I'm most proud of is we've consistently been on the best places to work in Connecticut the past few years. So we end up doing a good job bringing good people. So you mentioned uh, back in college, you felt like you were not good at finance or accounting. I wasn't. How, how have you kind of, manage that particularly when you were small and probably you couldn't just go out and hire somebody to do it for you? Did you learn it? Did you hire that role earlier on? How did you kind of deal with that? Or did you just decide it was a future problem? So I passed it off to other people because it was boring to me. I, I didn't like it. I was good at, at knowing that I could sell something for more than what it cost me. And that part I was good at, but, but tying it out to debits and credits was really uninteresting. Um, so, so I pass that along to other people. So, it's been a lot. It's been a long process. Obviously, you've taken a lot of risk in that process. Was there any point that was kind of make it or break it that you look back on and think that was close? Probably the first year and a half of the company, I felt like, what am I doing? Is this ever going to make it? And uh, was everybody else right? Am I crazy to think I could do this? Um, so there were a lot of moments early on uh, where I was worried about it. Um, when, when we finally got our momentum going, when, the non, when my non-compete ended and I could start marketing to people that I knew, um, we started to feel a little bit better about it, but um, it's one thing to want business and then it's another thing when people actually are ready to sign up and you have to execute. And uh, I'll never forget, um, we finally got our first customer, and they wanted to sign up for ID cards. And if you remember, I wasn't really planning on doing ID cards right away. 
And so uh, we needed to bring on a supplier to, to do those ID cards for us. And, and I knew who the suppliers were. I had worked with them for many years. So I called our supplier, or my previous supplier, and we had a lot of discussions with them, like, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to go after this business. We think we're going to be big one day. Um, so you guys should, should be our partner. And, um, and we ended up arranging this conference call. Now, this supplier is a multi-billion dollar company. Um, and my old company, Medavante, was probably their biggest customer, uh, specifically for, for healthcare communications. And so here I was, this little guy, talking to them saying, we're going to take all the business from, from Medavante, and they're going to end up with us, so you need to give us really good competitive pricing. You need to give us these service levels. And, um, and by the way, I'd really like you to not work with them anymore. You should just work with us. And, uh, and they laughed at me. Um, but, but I'll never forget, we've, we finally arranged a conference call because we were getting to the point where the, this prospect was in. They were signing up, and they needed to make cards in, in like two months or something. And so we had a conference call, and this big company, they have their COO on the call and all these other folks, and, and we're on the call with them. And um, one more time, I explain. I'm like, listen, this is what we're doing. We know what we're doing. You know, the customer you guys have is going to fall on their face. And, um, you know, you guys need to, you need to take this deal. You need, to, you need to be able to do this for us. And their COO gets a, speaks up on the phone and he's like, you know, Sean, I don't see how this makes sense for us. You know, we have a, a customer paying us a lot of money. You guys have this small little customer and um, I just don't see how this makes good business sense. So I, um, I hung up the phone on him. And <laughs> we were sitting like this, my partner Steve was right next to me and, and he looked at me like I had three heads. He's like, did you just hang up on the only supplier that might be able to bail us out and do this for us? And I'm like, yeah, I did. You know what, if they don't believe in us, then I don't want to work with them. And he's like, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> we finally have a customer. And uh, I'm like, we'll figure it out. And uh, <laughs> sure, sure enough, they called back, and they're like, you know what, we'll give you a chance. We're going we're gonna to do this for you. But they didn't terminate their relationship with, with my old company, but they ended up doing it for us. And and within a very short period of time, we became their biggest customer. So it worked out. But it was probably the gutsiest thing I ever did. And I'll never forget. <laughs> I'll never forget the look on Steve's face. He's, I, th I thought he was going to quit that night, actually. What do you think kept him around? How long did that callback take? <laughs> well, actually, the phone rang immediately because there were other people on the conference call. They're like, did Sean just hang up? <laughs> So I could like his cell phone rang right away, and, it, and uh, but it, it took it took another day or two, and then they were like, "No, we we need to do this. We believe in you guys, and and uh, we're going to take a chance." Which is really what I wanted to hear the first time we were on the phone is that they believed in us because if they didn't believe in us, you know, I didn't feel like it was going to succeed. So, thinking more generally. Um, are there any common mistakes you see in other entrepreneurs? Or looking back on your career early on, were there mistakes you made that you think now? Luckily, I've never made any mistakes. <laughs> uh, well, then other but, people. I mean, no. Um, yeah, no, we make, we make mistakes all the time, and I made plenty of them. Um, I can't speak for other entrepreneurs. I, I would think most successful entrepreneurs have a lot of uh, uh, run into a lot of roadblocks and, and a lot of pitfalls. Um, but I think mistakes make you stronger. And if you can, if you are uh, willing to live up to your mistakes and be honest about them with your customers, uh, most importantly, learn from them, um, I think they can be a major asset. And that's one of the things our customers love about us. You know, we're not perfect, nobody is. Um, but they love how reactive we are. You know, if we make a mistake, we do not hide from it, we do not make excuses. We look our clients in the eye and say, we messed up, and here's what we're doing to fix it. And uh, I think it's just a, a general thing people really appreciate. Um, from, from my personal standpoint, you know, the one thing that I could have done better or, or, or probably still could do better is 
you know, um, being an athlete, like everything doesn't have to be a sprint. I generally tend not to be the most patient person and I just want to run as fast as I can to, to tackle things and um, that's not always the right method. You know, sometimes you have to take the marathon approach and, um, and that's one thing I, I think I could have done better along the way. So do you guys have a kind of culture of owning to mistakes when they happen with customers? Is that something you have to, if you get an experienced person come into your team, you have to reprogram? Is that something you kind of design into activities or training or how you communicate with employees? So all of the above. Um, at Clarity, everyone in our organization knows who the boss is, and we, we talk about it all the time. And uh, when I first say that statement, everybody looks at me and they're like, we know you're the boss, we know you're the boss. And, and I say, it's not me, I'm not the boss. Our boss is the customers. Our boss is the people who send us money each month so that we all have paychecks, including me and everybody else here. Um, so at, at, at my company, everyone understands that. We're all working for the boss all the time. And at the end of the day, that's what matters. You know, you're not working to please me, you're working to please our customers so that they continue to be customers and continue to pay our paychecks. So looking forward for Clarity, what are kind of your hopes for the next one year, five years, and for yourself as well? Yeah, so um, I haven't thought about for myself yet, but for the company, um, you know, I, I have, there's, there's two things I talk about in every company meeting, actually three. One is who the boss is. Another thing we always talk about is being relevant five years from now and 10 years from now. It doesn't really matter what we're doing today. It doesn't matter what we did yesterday, what made our customers happy yesterday. What matters is are they gonna be buying from us five years from now? And are we going to be relevant to them? And are we trying to be proactive to what their needs are gonna be? Um, that's how you continue to grow. And the, the last thing I talk about in every company meeting is if you're not growing, you're dying. Um, so for us, it's, it's about being, being relevant and, uh, and maintaining focus on growing. So when I look out at the next year, next five years, we have really aggressive growth plans. We're, we're at 140 employees right now. I, I don't think it'll be very long till we're at 200 employees and, and continue to, to, to grow our revenue and our client base. Have you hit the point yet where you have the innovator's dilemma, you have a product that's working and you have to kind of turn away from it or hurt it a little bit to look towards the future? And if yes, how do you do that? How do you kind of give up a little bit today to get more in the long run? Yeah, we're, we're always investing in, in product development. Um, and there are times when you have to take a step back, you know, where the market might be screaming for something, but um, we don't want to deliver anything unless we're going to be really good at it. Um, so sometimes that, that might impact your short-term financials, your short-term opportunity, because there's one thing just to get a product out there and get people on it, but if it stinks, you know, it's not going to last. And so for me, it's about, you know, building something sustainable and making sure that whatever we offer to our clients is something we can look ourselves in the mirror and feel good about. Um, so in instances like that, we will take more time to make sure it's right before it gets out to the market. Um, so what role have mentors played in your success and who were kind of your main mentors? So frankly, I have one mentor and that was my father. My father ran a business and um, my father helped push me to, to have the guts to start Clarity. And um, I leaned on him a lot in the early, early days, especially when I really thought, um, you know, every day was a challenge. I didn't know if I was gonna make it. Um, but he, you know, kept me focused and uh, has been the one mentor and still someone I, I, I run to for advice today. Thank you. Thank you.